Chapter Thirty Two of Bizarre by Lawton McCall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nick Bulka. The Man with the Hose. A feeling of elation is like a feeling of alcohol. Under its stimulus, a person may do the most brilliant things, and also the most grotesque. It was just this feeling that took hold of Jack Carrington when the senior member of the firm invited him to dine at his apartment on the following evening and meet Mrs. Stockbridge and my daughter. During all the rest of the day, the young college man learning how to work in an office fairly walked on air, and that night, in his hall bedroom, he went through a sort of dress rehearsal of the role he hoped to play on the great occasion, resuscitating and donning his evening clothes, to make sure that they looked as well as they did when he led the commencement prom six months before, and marshalling all the bon mots he could recollect, in order that his supply of extempore witticisms might be adequate. Still buoyed up by this feeling of elation, Carrington presented himself next evening at the door of the sumptuous apartment house where the boss lived gave his name to one of the liveried grandees in attendance, and was shown up to E4, a gorgeous duplex suite half as large as a house, and renting for twice as much. Everything went off splendidly. The boss unbent to a surprising degree. Mrs. Stockbridge was most cordial, and the daughter proved to be a fascinator. What was more, Carrington surpassed himself as a socialite. He told several funny stories with considerable éclat, and, inspired by the thrill of the occasion, even thought up one or two original ones that surprised him as much as they impressed his hosts. When, later in the evening, he played bridge as the daughter's partner, he had a rush of hearts and aces to the hand. He made slams big and little at such a rate that Miss Stockbridge complimented him upon his skill. Consequently, when, after two victorious rubbers, he bid his host good night and noted from their effusiveness that he had made a very favorable impression, it was no wonder that he already pictured himself a member of the firm and the boss's son-in-law. As the door of the apartment closed behind him, he heaved a sigh of triumph. He felt like shouting or doing something violent. Tingling with pride, he strutted down the hallway toward the elevator. A shining brass fire nozzle, jutting out provokingly from a coil of hose, attracted his attention. It looked so like the head of some absurd animal that he couldn't help poking his finger into its mouth as he went by. His finger stuck. Facing the nozzle squarely, and taking hold of it with his free left hand, he pulled more carefully. Still it stuck. The finger was beginning to swell and turn red. He tugged it harder, with no result. Concluding that lubrication was necessary, he leaned over and licked it, acquiring a strong brass taste upon his tongue. Then he pulled hard. More swelling. By this time he was in a perspiration of misery. He paused and tried to think clearly, but his mind, which had scintillated all evening, was now a blur. His first lucid thought was that he must unscrew the nozzle from the hose. Why, of course! How simple! But when he tried turning the coupling of the hose, the nozzle insisted on turning with it, and his imprisoned finger was averse to revolving. Lapsing again into rueful speculation, he tried desperately to devise some means of regaining his liberty. Why not go ring the elevator bell? No, that was around the bend of the corridor, and his tether probably would not reach that far. And besides, it would be awful to have to explain his plight to a livery dignitary like the one who had convoyed him up. And suppose the elevator should arrive full of plutocrats coming home from the opera, or high-strung women who would shriek when they saw him with the fire hose. No, that could never be risked. He must think of something else. A little olive oil would probably do the trick. But how could he get it? 
If he had thought of that at first and gone right back and asked for it, it wouldn't have been so bad. But now, after nearly half an hour, his hosts were probably in bed. No, it was too late to ring their doorbell now. Suddenly, an ingenious idea occurred to him. He would turn on the water and squirt his finger out. Splendid. He reached up and turned the wheel. It made a mournful creaking sound, but no water came through the coil of hose. It must be shut off downstairs, he thought. Thanks to the incessant sting of his finger and the maddening exasperation of the predicament he was in, Carrington was nearly frantic. Oh, he exclaimed, I'll have to disturb them for that oil sooner or later, so I'd better do it right off. With that he started for the boss's door, trailing the hose after him. His heart thumped as he rang the bell. Standing in close to the wall, he kept the nozzle behind his back, thinking it better to explain before displaying his appendage. There was a sound of slippered feet, and from the opposite direction, a sound of slipping hose. The door was unlocked, and the remainder of the canvas and rubber coil that had kept back the water unrolled upon the floor. "'Who's there?' growled Mr. Stockbridge, arrayed in bathrobe and squinting out into the dimly lighted corridor without his glasses. Mortification seemed to paralyze Carrington's speech. Bringing the nozzle forward abjectly, so that Mr. Stockbridge could see his plight, he faltered. "'I—' At that moment his finger was shot like a bullet from a gun, and the ensuing stream of water caught Mr. Stockbridge squarely in the throat. Simultaneously a supreme inspiration came to Carrington. "'I'm a fireman!' he cried in a disguised voice. "'Wake your family at once!' Whereupon, as Mr. Stockbridge rushed back into the apartment, Carrington, dropping the hose, made a thrilling rescue of himself down the stairway, and darted into the street before the drowsy dignitary in the vestibule could raise his head. End of chapter 32